Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So happy to be here this morning. So glad to see everyone. Welcome to Pilgrim Valley. We are located at 1821 Wolf Street, where our pastor is Patrick H. Green, Sr. people have been asking me, am I going to sing this morning? <laughs> the Bible tells us when David was king, he built a temple where he could worship and praise God. Amen. When people would walk past that temple, they would see him in there dancing and singing, and right. giving praises to God. Yeah. People would thought that he was crazy. Yes. Yeah. And when they asked David, what are you doing? He would answer by saying, I'm enjoying Jesus. Hallelujah. Ooh, oh, oh. I'm enjoying Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Feeling mighty happy. Feeling mighty fine. I'm enjoying Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. I'm enjoying Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, y'all sing with me now. I'm enjoying Jesus. Hallelujah. Feeling mighty happy. Feeling mighty fine. I'm enjoying Jesus. Hallelujah. One more time. I'm enjoying Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm enjoying Jesus. Hallelujah. Feeling mighty happy. I'm enjoying Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's why I sing. <laughs> All right. We're beginning our morning worship. Could you please stand, please? Today I will be reading from Psalms, the 19th chapter starting with verse 7, and it reads as follows. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making sure it is simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous together. Move to desire a day with gold, ye that much fine goes, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is the servant warned, and in keeping of them there is a great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back the servants out from the primitive sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Them shall be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. I have read you Psalms, the 19th chapter, starting with the 7th verse. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your many blessings. We thank you for watching over us this past week letting no arms of protection come against us and no weapon prosper against us. We ask that you bless our church, bless our congregation, bless our pastor. Look out for our sick and our shut-in. Look out for our neighborhoods and our children. We ask these and our blessings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Morning, Pilgrim Valley. Welcome to the house of the Lord today. We thank God for another day. We thank God for another day. God, thank you, Lord, for waking us up this morning in our right frame of minds that we are here today worshiping together. So can we just exalt his name together as the word says? Can we lift him up together? Amen. King of glory, have your way today.
disrespect this morning. Pay homage to him this morning. When you think about what he's done for you, praise should just come out. Thank you, God. When you think about who he is, praise should come out. Gratitude. Oh, hell, King Jesus. You are the King of glory. You are welcome in this place. You are welcome in our hearts today, God. Have your way today, God. Yes. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are King. So let's start right now. Why Thank you. 
glory. God bless each and every one of you who are here to worship with us today. Oh, what a blessing it is to be here in God's presence. I want to thank the choir for setting a wonderful mood for our worship time, reminding us who it is we're here for. We're here to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of glory. The one who is worthy to be praised. And why wait? You know, because the song says, every knee's going to bow. Every tongue's going to, well, why wait? Let's why just wait? get on with it. <laughs> and honor and praise him, even today. Oh, what a, what a joy and a privilege it is to be with you. Old folks used to have a saying, look what the cat drug in. I'm not going to use that. I'm just going to say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For bringing our pastor back and, and giving him an opportunity and his family to, to be in the midst of our worship time. I also want to say thank you to whoever is responsible for the beautification of the Lord's house today. Coming in the back door this morning for Sunday school about 9.50 or 8.50 and uh, seeing the wonderful spread, it, it, was, it was just beautiful. Uh, just just uh, uh, an inspiration. So thank you for those responsible. I'm not sure who to credit for, but uh, you know who you are and God blesses you for beautifying his house. Well, grace and peace to each and every one of you for being here. And it's a wonderful opportunity to close a series of lessons from the book of 1 Peter this morning. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me to the book of 1 Peter, the fourth chapter and the first verse, which will be our text springboard this morning. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 1. And it reads, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Let's pray. 
Most gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before you and we come collectively as a congregation and those who are visiting among us. And Lord, we are grateful to be gathered and that this gathering is a place where you would come. Lord, we want your presence. We desire the moving of your spirit in our hearts to open our eyes to understanding of the things you've placed in your word. We pray to you, dear, heart, to, dear Lord, to speak to our hearts this morning. Open the truths of the word and open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of it. Father, we want to thank you for mercy that's been extended to us to give us life on this day. We thank you for the grace, Lord, that saved our soul and the grace that enables us to do all that we are able to do. Oh, Father, we are gathered today to worship. We're gathered also, Lord, to learn of you. We're gathered, Lord, to receive the truths of your word that your word might work in us your will, enlightening our eyes to understand your way and to do the things that are pleasing in your sight. Father, bless every heart. Speak to every mind. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Again, the text reads, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. I want to call these thoughts armed with Christ's mind. Armed with Christ's mind. The studies we've undertaken over the last several weeks in the book of 1 Peter, it's obvious Peter's goal in writing to the churches who would receive his letter and his epistle is to get them in a, a frame of mind, a frame of understanding about their lives in Christ. What to anticipate as those who have committed to Christ in service. Not to think that it's just going to be this beautiful bed of roses. Not to think that it's just going to be enjoying food and fun and fellowship all the time. But there are going to be hardships. They're going to, your faith in Christ is going to be challenged. You will go through manifold temptations. The trial of your faith, he describes it, uh, calls it fiery trials as well. And we've looked at some things that will help us in that process in the last few weeks. And today we, I'd like to wrap these thoughts up with this concept of arming our minds with the mind of Christ. There's a mindset for the follower of Christ. It is, in fact, the mind of Christ itself. He placed the glory of the Father and the redemption of humanity above his personal status, comfort, and preference. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he was to be arrested and crucified, prayed earnestly to the Father, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's the mind. That's, that's, that's part of, that's giving us insight into the mind of Christ. The mind that we're being told we need to arm ourselves with. Now Peter, much like Paul did in Ephesians 6, has used the, the language of armor and arming and, and uh, military terminology with respect to our Christian walk. And here he continues that this, this word armed here, uh, hapolo, hapolitos from Greek, it's the, the Greek soldiers, they called them hoplites because of the, the arms that they used in their, in their conflicts. That's what, he, Peter uses that terminology here to arm ourselves with the mind of Christ. It means there has to be a mindset in us that's consistent with the mindset Jesus lived his life with. If we are to be completely successful in following him as he would have us to. Jesus humbled himself in obedience all the way to the cross. To endure the testing of our faith requires us to be of the same mind 
we must look at our we must not look at all adversity as if something were wrong and that God must be displeased when in fact some adversity is precisely because we're doing the right thing in obedience to God. Christ's mission was to call his disciples and have them join in his mission. He wanted, he was very mission focused and he recruited disciples to join him in his mission. In the book of Mark chapter 8, Jesus said this to his disciples and it says, and he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and he and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again and and he spake that saying openly. Peter said, uh, Lord, uh, come, come here. Uh, Jesus, I, I, I need to say something to you. Scripture says, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Saying, get thee. And, but when he had turned about and looked on his disciples. So when Peter came and said, Lord, no, you're coming on a little strong, Jesus. Jesus turned around. He, he wanted all, I want all y'all to hear this. <laughs> I want all y'all. And of course, if you're from the South, you know what all y'all means. You know, all you, is sufficient by itself, and y'all is sufficient by itself. <laughs> so I've, I've, I've added to English grammar to understand what the terminology, what all y'all means. That is the emphatic plural. Okay? You know, there's... There's you and all makes y'all. And if you just say all, that, that would, that when you say all y'all, that, that's, that's the emphatic plural. And I, I think when his reply to, to Peter, Jesus used the emphatic plural here. <laughs> he says, but when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get thee behind me, Satan. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall save it. For what doth it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Wow, that's a challenge. But Peter says we need to be armed with that mindset that Jesus had. In chapters 3 through 5, we, we made it up through portions of chapter 2 in the last few weeks. In chapters 3 through 5, Peter gives very, very important insights that enable believers to equip themselves with the weaponry of Christ's values and priorities. We need that. It's an impossible task, though, without the grace of God. You can't live the life Christ calls us to without the empowerment of his spirit. You can't live it on your own. You can't live the life that calls you to a place that says, I have to put my preferences beneath God's preferences. I have to put my needs beneath the needs of others. That's a challenge. So what did Peter do? In, second, in First Peter chapter 2, he gives us some, some in, insights that we'll touch on a few verses from chapters 2, 3, and 4. And we'll conclude our thoughts. One of the first things he brings out, though, is the mind of Christ enables us to do right despite being done wrong. When it, it, it's not really possible without it. But with the mind of Christ, you can do right even when you're being done wrong. 1 Peter 2 and 12, right after the verse where we've been talking about the, the 
lust of the flesh and the problem with the war that, that we have with our flesh. He tells us about something else that's vitally important, and that has to do with experiencing adversity from people that we don't deserve or that we haven't, we haven't brought on ourselves. He says in verse 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And in the verses thereafter, we won't read them uh, in, in any detail, but those initial verses thereafter, he talks about the importance of our submitting to lawful authorities. That we're responsible, to how, regardless of how people treat us, we're responsible to conduct ourselves in compliance with lawful requirements. And then he reminds them down in verse 19 that we must remember that enduring mistreatment for obedience to God glorifies God. And God will remember what we do. Notice verse 19. He says, for this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Peter pointed out, he says, you know, there's no great thing if you break the law and you got to go to jail for it, or you break the law and you have to experience hardship for it. That's not something that's commendable. But if you do what's right and go through mistreatment, because of doing the right thing, God takes notice, and he won't forget your sacrifice in faithful service to him despite how you're being treated. He says in verse 20, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. That's something to keep in mind. That's, that's, that's something to keep in mind, that when, you, when people start mistreating you and you haven't done anything wrong, don't just say, oh, okay. No, recognize that you're doing what God's asked you to do and stay faithful in what he has asked you to do. Other people, let them lose their mind. Wondering, how can this person be this strong? How can this person be treated like this and not affected in a, in a way that we would hope they would be? We want you to lose you. I want you upset. <laughs> they, they're going to try to do that to you. But you just go on to work. You just go on through life. You just go on and you handle it. And you turn it over to the Lord. You let him carry it. And you don't worry about what's on their minds or what their intent was. You can learn from the experience of others without having to go through the experience of others. You can learn from the experience of Joseph and the mistreatment he received from his brother, his brothers and the mistreatment he received from Potiphar, the mistreatment he received in prison, and now he gets an opportunity to return in vengeance to his brothers when he finds them coming pleading in Egypt for food. But instead, because of the work of God in his life, the joy he had in serving God despite how he had been mistreated, when the time came, Joseph understood why God had taken him through what he had, and he blessed his brothers and his family. His brothers, though, were still thinking in the flesh, and his brothers looked at him, and after everything had settled down and daddy had passed, and they were like, you know, daddy gone now. Joe wasn't going to do nothing to us while daddy was here, but, you know, what, what's going to happen now? And Joseph says, look, y'all don't need to worry about me. What you intended for good, what, excuse me, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. That's the mind of Christ. That's the, the mindset of understanding that God's at work. God's carrying out a mission. God's carrying out a plan. And our part in it will take us through some things that we may not deserve. But it's not because of some forgetfulness of God or some meanness on his part. 
It's because he is working out something for his purposes. And he will bless us for allowing our lives to be a part of that plan. So focus in your life on obedience to God and not on the opposition. Sometimes that can be a mistake in, in everyday life that you can see in examples throughout life. Being a, a lot of a, a sports person coming up and still interested in sports, a lot of times my analogies go into that direction. I hope that's not a, a, a problem for, for some, but the point here is focus on obedience, not on the opposition. How many of you ever watched a sports event? Could be soccer, could be football, could be basketball. You've watched a sports event and you know what the game is. You understand enough about it to know that one team's trying to score and the other team's trying to stop them. And that the team that ends up with the most scores wins. That's what they're doing. But how many of you ever seen a game where the competitors are going at it? The coach has a strategy. He's trying to get his team across the goal or in the hoop or whatever, uh, whatever their goal is. And the other side's trying to stop it. And the coach is giving them responsibilities on the field, things they're supposed to be doing. And then you see one guy, he performs admirably. He does something well. And then he does something with the other player. And the other player gets upset. He said something to me. Oh, he treated me wrong. Oh, I ain't going to tell you. And I mean, he might take his helmet off, take off some of his gear, and he starts fussing and fighting. And next thing you know, he's got his dukes up. He takes a swing. And the next thing you know, the referee's blowing the whistle, throwing the flag, doing whatever they need to do. What's happened there? What's happened? Did, will, will that score any points? No. You won't get any points for that. Matter of fact, you might get put on the pine. In hockey, they put you in the penalty box. Football, they put you on the bench. Same thing in basketball. You coming out of the game, at least for a little while. And if you do something bad enough, you might not get back in the gym. They might take you to the locker room. Why? Because you're, you're off the page. You're, you're not in the game anymore. Well, you know, sometimes that can happen to believe, and that's one of the things the devil wants to do to you. That's one of his tactics is he wants to get you focused on the opposition and not on your obedience. You're in the game to do what you've been told. You're in the game to do your role, to carry out your responsibility so that your team can succeed. You're not in there for you in the slights that you might experience with somebody else. But, oh, how sad when that happens. I've, I've even seen whole games lost because one player just had to be known. I mean, it wasn't even a, wasn't even a fight. Just, just had to be individual. <laughs> you, know, you just got to know me. And all of a sudden, unsportsmanlike conduct, 15 yards, and your whole play gets changed, and your team doesn't score and you lose. Christians, let's focus on our obedience. In 1 Peter 3 and 10, listen to what advice Peter gives us. He says, for he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Those are the goals. That's what we're in the game for. That's what we're trying to do. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are upon their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Don't worry about who's the opposition. God's got them. He'll enforce the rule. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy, blessed are you, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Stay focused on your obedience and not the opposition. We need that mentality. 
That's part of arming ourselves with the mind of Christ. That was Jesus. Jesus stayed focused on the cross. He stayed focused in his ministry. Sometimes his disciples wanted to go one way, but Jesus said, no, I must needs go through Samaria. He had a mindset about his mission. Another thing that's vital, and it's right in the next verse, in verse 15. We need to be prepared to share the gospel. We need a mindset of gospel preparedness. We need a mindset of, of being aware that you carry a cure. You, God's given you as a believer in Christ. If you've accepted the gospel, he's given you the cure for sin in people's lives. He's given you the message they need in order to have a relationship with him, and he wants you to be ready to share that. That needs to be a focus of our minds and a, a, a priority of our thinking and a part of our awareness. He says in verse 15, but, but instead of getting all messed up in all of this nonsense and following the things of the world. Follow peace. Follow righteousness. Do the things that are right. Don't worry about who's against you. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And oh, it's so important to understand that's a whole big mindset to have an understanding of what the gospel is and having it handy and ready. You know how frustrating it is to need something and not have it on you? You know, you need a pen and you start looking in pockets and <laughs> reaching around and you ain't got it. You know, we should never be anywhere without the gospel. Where, where, where do you want to go in the world that you don't want to carry the gospel with you? Be ready always. Because if you're living according to the standards of Christ and at the values of Christ, with the mind of Christ, you will be reflecting the glory of Christ in your life. God's Spirit will do that. So that others will recognize there's something different about this one. I've heard a lot of these folks that say they believe, but that one, they just might. <laughs> they just might know that. And when the right time comes, they might just want to say, you know, Brother Mike, man, I've been hearing you sing for years. Can you help me? I, I just need to understand something. How do you know? How do you know that you know? What's going to be your answer? You need to be ready to say, why? You need to be ready to say, I was lost. Oh, I was lost. I didn't know up from down, left from right. I had messed up. I was guilty. I felt so bad. But I heard about the forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ. I heard about forgiveness of God from Jesus Christ. And I confessed. I told him I was wrong. I told him I had sinned. I told him I needed him. And I confessed and I believed. Somebody told me that I needed to repent of my sins and I did. They told me I needed to confess them and I did. They told me I needed to believe that Jesus' blood shed for my sins would cover my sins and enable me to have a relationship with God. And I believed. I believed in God forgave me and took the burden of sin off of my mind and off of my back, off of my life. And I've never been the same since. And I keep trying to learn. I keep trying to grow. I keep trying to know more. Because, you know, that's how you will express it with meekness. As is described here, with meekness and fear, respect. You know, too often people want to share the gospel and they want to put a long, bony finger in your face. You need to do this. That is... That's, I'm sorry, that's not meekness and fear. That, as Peter, excuse me, as uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, he says, the servant of the Lord must not strive. You know, we're not in this to fight 
the people who need to be saved? Must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. Teaching them about Christ so that they understand they're in opposition to themselves. Helping them to recover themselves into a relationship with God. We need to be prepared to share the gospel. And if you don't understand it, if you need to know more about it, then commit in your life to learn. Don't be, don't, don't be one that says, you know, I ought to learn that one of these days. But never, never make an effort. That puts it in, that, that explains where it is in your priority. Because one of the things I've learned about human beings, including the, the one I'm a specialist in, <laughs> We will do what we want to do. I mean, at, at, at some point, it comes down to it. We will do what we want to do. And if we make something a priority, we can do it. Especially something God wants done because he'll give us what we need to get through it. So Peter says, Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For again, here's this point. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evildoing. So he's again, he's telling us, arm yourself with this mindset, this understanding that everybody's not going to pat you on the back. It's not always going to be fun. It's not always going to be enjoyable and pleasurable. But when you do right and you suffer for it, God takes notice. And also, in the next verse, he points this out. We need to remember our Redeemer. And that will help. That will help you endure. Remember our Redeemer. For Christ also hath suffered once for sins. The just for the unjust that he might bring to God. Bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Well, if Christ is our standard, injustice should not be unexpected because there's never been a man more righteous and there's never been someone more mistreated. For even hereunto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. And Peter got a little, he, Peter was a little happy here, I think. I, he's, he, he couldn't help it. For we, you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Oh, will you keep that in mind? What Jesus went through unjustly, undeservedly for us, we should think it's no great imposition on me to have somebody give me a dirty look. To have somebody say some bad things about me. Love how the Hebrew writer put it in Hebrews. He says, for you've not yet suffered blood. You, you haven't suffered a loss of blood in your service. Just be faithful. Don't expect to not experience some adversity. Lastly, remember our reckoning. Remember our reckoning. In 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter says something that's uh, pretty stark that reminds us what lies ahead. Beginning at verse 12, he says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice. Rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. For if ye be reproached with the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of the glory and of God resteth upon you. 
On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. And you know what? God's going to remember what you've done. God's going to bear in mind exactly what it costs you. Jesus told his disciples, not only has given up anything in this life that you won't receive compensation for, both here and in my kingdom, I know what you're doing. When Jesus wrote the churches in the Revelation, the seven churches of Asia Minor, first thing he said to every one of them, I know your works. I know you. I know what you're doing. <laughs> I know what you've done. Notice verse 17 in First Peter 4. This is our last text. These three verses, 17 through 19. He says, for the time has come. This is our reckoning. For the time has come. He says, it's going to come, y'all, when judgment must begin at the house of God. Let that sink in for a moment. How many of y'all ever got sent to the principal's office? <laughs> You don't, have to, you don't have to raise your hand. I, I, that's, that's, that is an entirely rhetorical question. But your, your laughter answered for you. Y'all know what it was like. Get sent to detention hall, sent to the principal's office, and uh, know that moment of accountability. Know what happens when the grades are getting posted. Know that, that, you're, that the time of... of Preparation is over. Now the product's done, and you're going to be weighed on it. And so that's what Peter's trying for. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel? It's like, whew, God's going to judge us, but, I mean, their judgment is incomprehensible. Eternal separation from God. But you and I are going to give account, too. He says, and if the righteously scarcely be saved, because we're saved by grace, no, no doubt about that, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. Just trust God in your life through the adversity that you may go through. Put your life and commit it into his hands, knowing that he will take care of you as unto a faithful creator. You don't know what's going to happen, but you know who controls what happens. You can have that mindset that was in the mindset of the Hebrew boys, as we call them, who were being threatened in the day of Daniel who were told because they wouldn't submit to the ordinances of the things they ought to eat, that they would be put in a burning, fiery furnace, heated seven times harder than it ought to be. And they were thrown in. They were just, just do right. Just obey me and you can walk away. And they said, King, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. We can't bow. We know who God is. And he's not you. And he's not the one you say it is. So God can deliver us from this burning fiery furnace. But if he doesn't, I'm st we're still not going to do what you want us to do. That's committing your soul unto a faithful creator. And they put them in there and the fire was hot and, and they looked in there and it wasn't just three in there. It was four. <laughs> walking around in there. And they came out and didn't even smell like smoke. Because God was with them. And the same thing, of course, happened a little later with Daniel. When he wouldn't pray to their God, instead he prayed to the Lord as he traditionally and faithfully did. And they threw him into the lion's den. And Daniel prayed to God. And the Lord stopped the lion's mouth. That's committing your soul to a faithful creator. In conclusion, becoming a Christian is the beginning of the believer's life in Christ. That's the point we made in the very first lesson. Becoming a Christian is the beginning 
Peter wrote his epistle for our benefit to understand what challenges to expect, how to face them in the power of God, and how to please God with faithful obedience. We have a life that will survive physical death. You've got that right now. John wrote, he that believeth in the Son hath life. Hath life. That's, we would say hath. It's present tense. It's a present possession. He that hath the Son hath life and shall not come into condemnation. You, you're saved eternally. That is your condition and position before God. So becoming a Christian is the beginning of the Christian life. We have a life that will survive physical death and will last forever. But in the meantime, we must be prepared to fight for the faith. As Paul wrote to Titus, or, uh, or as uh, was written in, in the book of uh, Jude, excuse me, that was once delivered to the saints, to fight for the faith, earnestly contend for the faith. We've got to put ourselves in that position to understand we're not in this for ourselves. When people slight us and other things don't go our way, that's not something for us to lose track of focus of what we're here to do and why we're here for the glory of the Lord because we want him glorified ultimately and not our preferences. We must expect that the enemy of our soul will scheme against us. As Peter writes in the fifth chapter, we don't get there, but he, in the fifth chapter he says, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, stalks about seeking whom he may devour. But y'all, the Lord's got him. The Lord's got that little kitty on a chain. That, that little kitty can't hurt you. Scripture tell us Jesus talked to Peter, and Peter, he saw the condition Peter was in, and he said to Peter, he said, Peter, <laughs> the devil will sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. And you, you, when, when you get through this, you're going you're gonna to take care of your brothers and sisters. And this is the same, this is the man that's written us First Peter. This is the man who was told by Christ that Christ's prayer for him would deliver him from the snare of the enemy, from Satan himself. We must expect that our enemy will scheme against us and try to prevent us from bringing glory to God and bringing souls to him for redemption. Expect that. But we must not be deterred, but determined to remain faithful until Christ's kingdom comes. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Please stand. Please stand. Where are you today? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you trusted him? Have you come to that place in your life when you realize that everything you tried to make yourself happy and joyful just hadn't worked? Oh, you had a little pleasure for a little while, and then the next morning came up, sun came up, and it was gone. First time somebody said something cross to you, you lost it, you became depressed and wondered, just, there's got to be more than stuff in this world. There's got to be more than what I see and taste and touch. There's got to be more than the disappointment that comes from people and relationships in my life. There is. There is an eternal God that loves you eternally, has loved you before you came into being, and made a way for you to have a relationship with him forever and life eternal. And he wants you to have it. He wants you to know him. He wants you to know peace and joy. He wants you to have an experience that doesn't match anything else that people experience in this world. A peace that passes understanding. Just won't even make sense but you'll have a smile anyway in your heart because of what God's doing. Do you know that peace? Do you know that joy? Do you know how to, to obtain it if you don't? Well, there's folks right here that can help you with that. And when our service is done, please come. Let's talk. As the Lord said through Isaiah, come. Let's reason together. Oh, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made as white as snow. You just need to come to the Lord. Tell him what you've done wrong. He knows. 
Confession isn't informing God of what you've done. It's admitting to yourself your need for him and declaring to him a desire to have him fix your brokenness. And he can. Yes, he can. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You can stand if you wish or keep your seat if you prefer. But let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, our altar prayer. God knows what's going on in your life. But that doesn't mean you don't need to talk to him about it. Talking to God is a special way we have of bringing things to the forefront of our consciousness and making us aware of God's sufficiency to handle what troubles us. The Lord said, call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee. Call on me in the day of trouble and, I, and thou shalt glorify me. And let's call on him because we need God. Oh, we need him. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, the people of Pilgrim Valley and those who are welcome in our midst have come together today, Lord, and we're glad to be together in this place. We're glad, Lord, to have the privilege to pray to you, our creator, the sustainer of life, to pray to a, a God who knows us intimately in exquisite detail. Father, there's not a word in our tongue you don't know. There's no place we can go that we can escape you. Father, you know us in and out, up and down. And you know right now we need you. You know the sin we've struggled with that we haven't overcome. But Lord, we're ready. We're ready to put it down and we want you to help us, Lord. We're ready to overcome because that's what you want us to be, overcomers. We're ready, Lord, to share, get over our fear and our shyness, because that's what you want us to be. Lord, we're ready to trust you, even though we've been timid and ashamed. Father, we, we want you to move in us, draw alongside us, pick us up, Lord, dust us off, work in us by your spirit to grow your fruit in our lives that others might see your peace, your joy, your contentment, your patience. Oh, Lord, we want everything about you to be in us. Father, we just confess our need for you today. Father, there's some here with health needs, emotional needs, financial needs. But Father, you know all of our needs, especially the spiritual need, because you're looking for purposely at the heart and the heart lines up with you so many other things just seem to come together and be as they should so help us Lord to put you first in your kingdom and its righteousness and knowing that the rest of what we need Lord will come as you order 
So order our steps, Lord, in your word. Guide us and lead us by your tender hand. We trust you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for bringing us through trials. We thank you for carrying us when we can't walk anymore. We thank you, Lord, for loving us when we were unlovable. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the unbound. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Father. Help us to follow you faithfully. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Good morning again, brethren. I want to ask the officers to come now, deacons and ushers for the morning offering. Honoring God by giving is scriptural. God tells us to give. And he gives us that privilege to give to him in a statement of respect, a statement of thanksgiving, a statement of worship of his worthiness to receive a statement also of our commitment to the fulfillment of the ministry works of the church a statement of ours to provide resources for helping those who are in need all of those are things that God moves on our heart to share and to give in the local church let the spirit of the Lord move your heart this morning don't do it in some desire to show other people anything because that will not be acceptable to God. The money will still be used, but, but don't think you've done something that honored God or that he appreciates if you haven't done it to honor him. Let it be to honor the Lord and glorify him. And he'll take whatever you offer. He'll take what's offered in sincerity and truth and he'll bless it. He'll bless it. If all you got's the widow's might, the widow's might can be mighty in the hands of an almighty God. Trust that. Believe that. And give with a, a, a heart of faith and trust in him. And God will bless. He'll bless it. Just as the little boy gave his fish and loaves, Christ turned it into enough to feed a multitude. He still does that. Let's trust him. Thank you for this offering. We ask that you bless the ones that gave and the ones that were not able to give. Please accept this offering in the building of your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 It's first Sunday, and we have the blessing and privilege to partake of the Lord's Supper and reminding us of the sacrifice of Christ. I think aspects of this morning's message were a, a very appropriate a predicate to worship by that means. Having the pastor back, we have the privilege of having our pastor to lead our communion service this first Sunday. Pastor Greg. The church said amen. 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 So grateful and so thankful. Amen. Come on, let's just bless Reverend Smith. Thank you for him. Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful message. Wonderful series of messages. 
Great man, I'm just so grateful that he allowed God to use him tremendously throughout this past month or so. Amen. I asked him, and one thing he touched on this morning, he said, be ready to give an answer to the hope that's in you, and you have to always be ready. And when I asked him about preaching, he was ready. You don't have to sit there and wonder and worry and get to trying to figure stuff out. Amen. It takes a commitment to stand each week and to pour out for him to go into a series. We thank God that he, God used him in that first Peter series. Amen. So just uh, we have been indebted to him, amen, his committed work to not only preaching, but also to sharing every Sunday morning in our Sunday school. We're so grateful for that. Amen. Then to our Dusty Deacon this morning, we thank God for him. Now y'all looking at me strange when I say Dusty Deacon, but Deacon James King, then listen, in the, in the Bible, whenever you would see the deacons, they were known as dust runners. So that meant they kicked up dust anytime they were moving because they were serving. So when I look at him, he's been doing everything this morning. And so I call him a dusty deacon. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So thank God for him and what he's been doing. And just so good to see all of you. Thank God for you. Been missing seeing your faces. Amen. Thank you for your, your prayers, your phone calls. Pastor doing wonderful. I am doing a whole lot better. Amen. Thank God for healing. Amen. And so just take let God have his, his way. We're getting ready to share. I want to go to 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, real quick, as we get ready to worship God in our uh, Lord's Supper. Amen. I just want to touch on a few things in there. We usually use that particular, uh, we typically go there because it's so rich and, and gives so many uh, instructions as to how, the when, the where, and the why uh, concerning the partaking of the Lord's Supper. So I always want to look at that. If you go to 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, you would notice that Paul, as he writes to this church, and I've said it before, he is actually uh, responding to questions that have been given to him. They wanted to do right. It's, isn't it something when the church wants to do right? And they asked him, how do we get it together? We, we realize we've been doing things. We don't want to be doing stuff in vain. How are we to, to worship? He teaches them how to worship. He said, how are we to act in so many areas? And then even concerning the Lord's Supper, they wanted to know, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to take it? What uh, pleases God. And so he gives them instructions on that. And so when we look at the Lord's Supper, we know the Lord's Supper is also called, uh, some call it the communion, some call it uh, the holy uh, uh, communion, some call it the cup of blessing, some call it the breaking of bread, and it's also called the Eucharist, or what is known as the giving of thanks. And so when we look at the Lord's Supper, notice when Paul writes is that it was instituted in the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed. Isn't that something? The same night that he's going to be betrayed, rather than him fussing and rather than the Lord becoming vengeance, he said, listen, I'm going to do something different. You've been used to celebrating the Passover, and so what he does, he institutes the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Supper is to commemorate his death. It's, it's really to, not just so much the death, but to commemorate him, and, and he does that because as children of God, we have to be reminded of what he's done for us. It's, it's not to remember uh, the apostles. It's not to remember uh, that night in particular. It's not to remember so many uh, other people. It's not to remember the, 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 you know, the prophets, but it's to remember him. And he always says, he says, this do in remembrance of me. And so when you take the Lord's Supper, you are taking the Lord's Supper to remember him. No other reason. You are not taking it to say, listen, I got baptized and I want people to know I'm a Christian. Uh, I want people to know I've been baptized. I got, uh, I'm, I messed up on last night. I went to the club. I messed up on last week and I got to get it right with God. And if I don't take this, I'm going to die and go to hell. No, it's to remember him. And he said, as often as you do this, you are doing this in remembrance of me, which means that it's every time you do it, whether it's every day, every week, Every month, every year, whenever you do it, your sole purpose for taking the Lord's Supper, the elements of the bread and wine, is to remember him. And so then also what it does, it signifies his death and seals him. But then there's several, several things I want to look at real quick. And, and if you go down to chapter 11 in that first Corinthians and look down at verse uh, 20, he says, when you come together, notice what he's saying. We got to come together. How can we remember him apart? In the same place. He says, come together. Verse 21, for eating, everyone taketh before the, his own supper. One is hungry, one's drunken. But he says, listen, I'm not going to praise you in this. You, uh, you, you come in, you shame the house of God. They were really having a party. 
And in the mix of that party, they would put the Lord up, saying they were celebrating him. But when you drop down to verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he break and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Now, what happened a lot of times, because they were taking it in the wrong manner, uh, they were taking it for the wrong reason. He said that they would be considered unworthy. And what unworthy meant was not that they were so righteous in themselves. But if you take the Lord's Supper for any other reason than to remember him, you're taking it in the wrong manner. You're unworthy to take it. And so what the Lord does, he says, because this ordinance is so serious, is so serious that it can also bring sickness to your body. If you showed up today and you're taking the Lord's Supper for any other reason than to remember him, you bring sickness upon yourself. Ultimately, he says, you continue on taking it for the wrong reason. He said, you can bring death upon yourself. Isn't that something? So I challenge you this morning to go back and have a fresh look, a fresh insight, and look at why you're taking the Lord's Supper. We've come today to celebrate Jesus. And so as we eat and drink together, we do in remembrance of him. And the church said, amen. this time we have any announcements. I know we have one. Uh, boxes of Love um, will be uh, next Saturday. Saturday after next will be on December 17th from 10.30 to 11.30. And so if you need a box or you know someone that has a need that needs a box of love, this is something Sister Harris has been doing as long as I've been here, probably a whole lot longer. And uh, you all will get in contact with her to make sure you've got the right head count and, uh, and do the Sister Larry. Thank you, Sister Larry. And any more announcements, don't forget on Christmas morning, as we celebrate uh, the Lord uh, coming into our world, we will be having our youth will be presenting uh, their uh, annual uh, youth day, their annual uh, Christmas day program to us. Amen. So we want to be and come out on Christmas Sunday morning and encourage our youth. Amen. Brother Hill, and then I see uh, Reverend Browning. Amen. Youth uh, will be going, I mean, Alexander Youth Ministry, Alexander Ministry this afternoon at 4 o'clock. All right. And I've seen somebody else. Sister Pam. Youth, uh, our children will be practicing this Tuesday at 5.30 in You come out and bring them. Don't just drop them off like they're going to babysitter. Come hang out with them for a while. Amen. They might put you in the program. Amen. So many times we want to get on program. You might find your you might find your starting spot and your role on the program. That was Mr. Brown saying, it put me on program. You you come out, they might put you on on program. Amen. I've been gone too long, ain't I? <laughs> Amen. Again, I think that's all we have. Uh, let me encourage, uh, again, the Smith family, I want to encourage them. Uh, I was, again, and that's First Peter. It's something about that when you, when you are doing what God wants you to do, you will find out that you'll suffer and have your own share of suffering. And sometimes Satan comes and launches everything he had. He launches the whole kitchen sink at you. 
And so I want to be praying for his family as well and loss of his grandbaby, amen, that was uh, supposed to be here next year. But God already knows. So again, as he continued to preach and teach and going, he's having to deal with his own share of suffering. So we want to lift him in, uh, in prayer. We want to continue to lift up your families as well. Pastor uh, Reverend Smith, come on back and lead us out in a, a benediction. All right. Thank you, Pilgrim Valley. Please stand. Our benediction is going to come as they have through the series from First Peter. Peter's closing in his book, beginning at verse 10 of chapter 5. But the grace of the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And let us all say, Amen.